everybody welcome to Adelaide Christian Centre how are we all doing on this beautiful cold day nobody likes the cold okay then well let's get you all warmed up shall we would you like to stand with me today Psalms 34 verse 4 says I sought the Lord and he heard and he delivered me from my fears this morning if there is fear anxiety whatever you are needing an answer to come come this morning and come and join us as we worship the Lord amen as we usher in the Holy Spirit to come and dwell and have his way amongst us so this morning I'm just gonna ask if you would just lift up your voices we're just gonna take a few minutes just to worship him we give you glory Lord we give you praise we welcome Holy Spirit oh we welcome you in this place come and have your way Lord as I see your voices this morning, church. We glorify the King of kings. You are the Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Psalm 34 says, I sought the Lord and he heard and he delivered me from my fear. Let's sing this morning. Welcome Holy Spirit. Living waters, 
Praise because he's sovereign, isn't it? Well, praise because you saw, praise because you reign, praise because you rose and defeated the grave. Oh, praise because you're faithful, praise because you're true, praise because there's nobody greater than you. Oh, praise because you're sovereign, praise because you reign, praise because you rose and defeated the grave. Praise 
thank you, Father God, that you are here with us. That you've never left us. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are all around us. I'm waiting for our hearts to be open to you to move. Holy Spirit, rain down this morning.
I just really feel that some of us today just really need to trust in God. We can say it, we can lip sync it, but deep within there is something that's pulling us away from not trusting Him. He is our blessed assurance. And He wants to, I just feel that He just wants to encourage you. Put your trust in me. I love you. I sent my one and only son for you. I'm not going to leave you, nor will I forsake you. Trust. Trust in the almighty God. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been the fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. And what He did for me on Calvary is more. Trust in God, my Savior, the one who That's why I trust Him. 
the glory and praise father we thank you for the opportunity of coming together as your people as people who are redeemed translated from the from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light we're here rejoicing we thank you for what you have done on the cross we thank you for what you have done in our lives for this church we thank you for what you're doing and Lord, we are excited for what you're about to do in the lives of your people. We commit our morning service to you from beginning to the end. We honor your presence. Your word declares whenever two or three gathering in your name, you are in the midst of them. So we forget about ourselves and we open our hearts and minds and allow the spirit of God to rule and reign. May you invade our morning service. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a clap of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness. You can go back to your seats. Good morning. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for making us part of your Sunday morning. It's good to be back. We, uh, we spent... Two weekends and one full week in Tennant Creek. Church is doing really well and send, sending you greetings from our church at Tennant Creek. We have a good a combination, mix of indigenous and non-indigenous, a lot of Africans and some Fijians there. And it was an amazing time for us when we can just share our hearts and just um, develop or um, just grow our relationship with our team in Tennant Creek. Pastor Mike and Kel are in India at the moment. Please do include them in your prayer. Friends, we're now moving to the next part of our service. We're going to have our communion time, and I may ask the, the stewards to begin distributing the elements, please. Thanks. Friends, we are continuing our series, Themes from the Ephesians, and last Sunday, Pastor Neil pre preached really well, and um, touch on the text Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 it says in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins that 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 verse long you can dwell in that for weeks in him in Christ we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our sins and redemption really means to buy back a possession previously owned and when we talk about redemption we're not just talking about a change of position but also a change of location we are now in Christ 
not outside Christ. Christ now in our lives is a reference point. Christ rules and reigns in our lives in every single moment of every day. And there's a, a Greek word, when, when we talk about redemption, there's that few Greek words, agorazo, exagorazo, and um, another one. But exagorazo, I just would like to focus on that. It means taking a slave from the place of slavery to a place of total freedom. So exagorazo, taking a slave from a place of slavery to a place of total freedom. In ancient times where slaves were sold in the marketplace, and uh, in this case, for us, Jesus paid the price of our slavery and has taken us from the kingdom of darkness and translated us, transferred us into the kingdom of light. Colossians 1.13 declares, For he has rescued, delivered, redeemed us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son, of the son he loves. Another verse in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 2. 8, 1 to 2, it says, There is therefore, because of what Jesus did on the cross, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, to those who walk in the Spirit and not on the flesh. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. In these two passages, you will find that there are two kingdoms, two governments, and two laws. You know, in my entire life, I live in two different countries. I was born and raised in the Philippines, and the Philippines is a republic form of government ruled by a president governed by their own land. 1995, we made a decision. We moved to Australia. But when I moved to Australia, I am now under a federal government ruled by a prime minister and governed by the law of this land. And because I changed location, the law of the land in the Philippines has no power over me. I am now governed by the law of this land. Friends, in the kingdom of darkness, the enemy rules and it is governed by the law of sin and death. In this kingdom, whatever you do will lead into sin and will always produce death. That's the realm of the kingdom of darkness. In fact, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But in the kingdom of light, where we are now, God rules and governs by the law of the spirit of life. For you and me, Jesus paid the price. We are redeemed for those who are translated or who migrated into the kingdom of light. Everything we do now brings life, produces life. Whenever we pray, we bring life. Whenever we lay our hands, everything we do produces life because it is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that governs our life now. And friends, these communion elements remind us that we are no longer under the kingdom of darkness, governed by the law of sin and death. We are now in the kingdom of light, governed by by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Be encouraged by these words. I would like you to close your eyes. Let us pray. Father, we're so, so grateful to be here together with our fellow believers rejoicing because of what Christ did on the cross. The Bible declares that without the shedding of his blood, there's no remissions remission of sins and through his blood he brought us back to you 
Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you have done, all the suffering on the cross. Thank you for setting us free so that we can live in your kingdom and experience, Lord God, your faithfulness and your goodness. As we partake of this partake of these elements, Father God, we also remind ourselves of what the book of Psalms says, forget not all his benefits. As we partake of all these elements, Lord God, we also receive healing, provision, answer to all our needs. We thank you for what you have done on the cross for us. We give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Let us eat and drink. Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. Wonderful Lord. Precious Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for redemption. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your life. We honor you, we glorify you, we magnify you. Thank you, Pastor Greg. The uh, ushers will come through and collect the glasses if you just pass them along to the end of the row. And folks, uh, we're going to have a time of prayer now. We're going to um, pray for one another. And uh, if you've come this morning and you've got a burden, a need, physically, practically, financially, relationally, if there's anything that's happening in your life where you need God's intervention, we're going to spend the next few minutes in prayer. And uh, the Bible is so full of this powerful way we interact with our Heavenly Father. Prayer. Prayer is talking to God. Prayer is asking Him for intervention in so many ways and Jesus again and again invited us invites us today to pray so what we're going to do as just the musicians just uh, in the background minister we're going to invite anybody that wants specific prayer to come forward now today we are thrilled to have as our guest speaker Dr Barry Chant and he'll be coming in a few minutes to open up God's word and as many of you know, we are going through a series in the book of Ephesians. And uh, pa Pastor Barry or Dr. Barry is going to uh, continue in that theme. And uh, then at the end of his time, there'll also be a time for response uh, to the word that he shares with you. And he'll talk about that when he comes. But right now, we just want to uh, focus on praying for one another. And anyone that has a specific need, feel free to slip out of your seat if you could just come now. Musicians, if you just minister a little bit there in the background and um, come to the front and we will pray one for another. The elders, pastors, uh, prayer leaders will join you and we'll pray for you and then we'll come back. We'll have our offering and notices and then Dr. Barry Chant will come to open God's word today. Slip out of your seat now and come.
Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your presence. Let every need be met. We think all of, also of those who are not here today because of illness or situations where they need your intervention. Extend your hand of healing and deliverance and victory and peace and life, we pray. In the name of Jesus. In the matchless name of Jesus, we give you thanks, Lord. Amen. Amen. Folks, we're going to prepare to receive our offering. You can do this through our church app. You can do it online. You can do it at the FPOS machine on the info counter. In fact, you can even use cash and put it in the bucket. Uh, so we're going to ask our stewards to prepare to receive the offering. Thank you for your continued support, your honouring of the Lord through our tithes and offerings and giving. We bless you. We thank you so much for your support of the ministry, the life of the ministry of this church. So, um, Father, we thank you today as we receive our tithes and offerings that we, we are a part of what you are doing in this city, in this state, in this nation, and indeed in the nations. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to ask the stewards to come through and receive the offering. In just a moment, we'll go to our screen and have a look at some video announcements. The, uh, the new Connect uh, news is out. There are copies available down near the entrance and on the info desk. That's for June. And there's an updated version of uh, Global Missions, what we are doing uh, here as a church and our group of churches in uh, World Mission. So get your copy if you haven't got that. And um, as Pastor Greg said, uh, our senior pastor, uh, Pastor Mike and Kelly, are in India. I'm sure some of you are following them on Facebook, what they're doing. They'll be back late this week here for next weekend. Of course, uh, we've got a few folks uh, enjoying the long weekend in places other than Adelaide. Uh, but it's great that we have a great gathering of folk here today. So thanks for being with us. So let's go to our notices on the screen and then I'll introduce our speaker for today. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Adelaide Christian Center. Thank you for joining us this morning. It is that time for the announcements, but before I go through some of them, we're gonna come around the time of giving. If you would like to give, you can place your givings in the bucket that comes past, or you can also give electronically. There is an FPOS machine available at the info desk if you would like to give after the service, or you can visit the link on the screen as well as scan the QR code at the back of the seats if you would like to give online. Just a friendly reminder, we do not have PM service tonight. And on Friday, 14th of June, we have our senior catch up from 10 30 a.m here at LA Christian Center there'll be praise and worship word fellowship and food special talk by Cassie Beattie on necessary documents if you are interested for more info please contact Jenny Peters and on Saturday 29th of June we have our new arrivals dinner if you are available to help please contact the church office so we can get your name and details 
And coming up on Sunday, 14th of July, we have our International Fiesta Sunday. That will be starting from 10 a.m. Come in your national dress and then feel free to invite your family and friends. And from the 11th to 13th of October this year, we have our church camp coming up at Big Four Barossa Tourist Park. More details will be announced soon, but please look forward to that and calendar in those dates. And just a friendly reminder, we do have a church app available if you would like to download that and access some church sermon notes, as well as some other extra church content available on that app. And lastly, the cafe is closed today. And that is all the announcements we have for you this morning. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful Sunday. There you go. Got it twice. So uh, thanks, Bruce, for helping. And uh, yes, it's all happening. And uh, don't forget to open your church app as Dr. Barry Chant comes to the platform just now. So we invite uh, uh, Barry to come up. Uh, Barry is a longtime friend uh, and, in fact, was on the staff here in this church many years ago. And many of us know him and his wife, Vanessa, who is here also, and their ministry, their teaching ministry. Barry was the uh, founder, president of two chairs, one each, of um, Tabor, Tabor uh, College, and some of you have trained and gone to classes at Tabor. And Barry is a very prolific writer, and uh, his books, some of his books, are, are available after the service for sale. I'm sure he'll talk about that. And uh, today, we are privileged to have him with us today to share from the book of Ephesians as a part of our uh, series out of the book of Ephesians. Uh, Barry and Vanessa have been long-time personal friends. So, uh, Barry and Vanessa, thanks for being with us today. We invite you to come, open up your heart and share God's word with us. Let's put our hands together as he comes. Oh, good morning, everyone. And thanks, Pastor Neil, for your warm welcome and uh, the warm welcome that we received as we arrived here today. I do apologize that I was rather ill-mannered and brushed a few people off because we just had some things to sort out beforehand. So try again afterwards and we may get on better then. <coughs> it's uh, my uh, experience in more recent years that I spend most of my preaching time speaking in someone else's church. And so um, I just won one church one Sunday morning and I tried to explain what was happening. So I said, look, um, you know, your pastor's away and, and I'm here. And so I hope that the word of God comes through just as well as it might usually do. And then I said, um, you know, sometimes when you uh, break a window, you have to put something, a replacement window or something in there. If you haven't got a window, you might just get a sheet of plywood or pressed uh, wood or something to stick it in there instead. I said, the trouble with that is that it never lets the light through. So I said, I hope today that my message here is uh, like a real pane of glass and that it's not like a piece of wood. And after the service, one lady came up to me, she said, oh, pastor, I want to tell you this morning, you are not like a piece of wood. You are a real pain. <laughs> and for those who have English as a second language, I'm sorry if you didn't get the point of that. So, it's an honor to... Uh, it's an honor here to be speaking uh, at, on this platform. I, mean, I always regard uh, any speaking opportunity as, 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 uh, as an honor because... To be asked to share God's word with people, whether it's a large number or a small number, is always a wonderful thing. So I'm honoured and delighted to be here today to, to share with you. Um, not to say this is sort of holy ground or anything, I mean, I've still got my shoes on, but um, uh, there's a sense which um, nevertheless is not a light thing to be in this place. And I do hope that, well, I certainly... That's how I feel about it. And I mean, when I was pastoring, I used to be very careful to, with our young people, especially who kind of run all over the place. I said that even on the platform, even if you're not preaching, just think that's a place where the word of God is delivered and it's a place to be respected. All right. <clears throat> uh, Pastor Neil mentioned a few, mentioned my books. Um, we have been, my wife and I, publishing books for a long time. 
and distributing them, but we're getting to the age stage now where we're trying to wind down that side of our ministry. And so we have some books here today, and uh, some of those books are free. All you have to do is just take one. It's a genuine offer. There's no please fill in your name and address or anything like that, just genuine. If you want a book, take one. <clears throat> but there are some conditions. And the main one is only take it if you want to read it. You know, I mean, some people, if it's free, they'll just grab whatever it is. But you know, if you don't want it, don't take it. Or if you want to give it to somebody else, that's fine. There's a couple of other books there that are for sale <clears throat> at, uh, at reduced prices. So do have a look there. I haven't brought a lot today, so you need to be quick. Um, a couple of books I'll mention. This one called Empowered by the Spirit. That's a book that usually sells for $25. But it's free if you want one. And the uh, theme this morning is Sealed by the Holy Spirit. And some of the things I'll say this morning are to be found in that book, plus a whole lot more. There's also this one, Praying in the Spirit. It's also free. It's a $15 book, also free. So, and as the name suggests, Praying in the Spirit, it just, that's what it's all about, how to pray in the Spirit and what that means, the whole you know, gamut of that, and praying in the fruit of the Spirit, praying in the gifts of the Spirit, and so on. Um, also, we've got just the three sets of the Spindles children's books. Some of you know them, I think. Who's, who's remembers uh, the Spindles books? Oh, yeah, quite a few hands going up. Well, <clears throat> you know, it's 50 years now since the first Spindles book was published. And strangely enough, he looks just as young now as he did then. Um, and uh, we're going to celebrate next year, if we can, with an anniversary volume, which will have some new stories in it and also some of the best of the old stories. So, but we've still got some of the original books, so if you want to grab a set of those, but they are for sale, they're $50 a set. It's seven books for $50, which you can work out. It's just over $7 each, so it's pretty good. And there's one or two other books there, too, that you might like to look at. Um, of course, you don't have to take a free book. If you want to buy one, you can. <laughs> but you set the price if you want to do that. We can take the, um, any sales or the, anything like that. We can take with cash or with credit card. So just see us back there. All right, <clears throat> theme this morning is sealed by the Holy Spirit. I think, here we go. That didn't work, did it? It did work, well, I think he did, <laughs> okay. All right, um, and uh, that as Pastor Neil has suggested comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's chapter 1, it's verse 13, and uh, whoops, uh, we can just read it there on the screen. And this is what it says. In whom you also, the whom refers to Christ, in Christ you also, having heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom having also believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Um, if uh, you want to take, if you're taking notes, you may like also to jot down the Second Corinthians chapter one, um, verse twenty-one, which says much the same thing that the Holy Spirit is, is, is our guarantee, the guarantee of our inheritance that we have in Christ. So, before we come to actually read the scripture, I wonder if you'd join me in praying this prayer with me. Let's pray it together, right? Heavenly Father together that means everybody speaks all right let's pray again heavenly father as we come to your word today please give us sharp minds to understand and soft hearts to believe in jesus name amen there's a great danger in making our faith only intellectual where it's only what we can work out and reason there's another danger in uh, making it only what we feel and both of those on their own are inadequate. So we need to have a faith that sharpens our mind and a faith that also stirs our hearts. So that's what we pray for then. All right, now here's this text. Um, in whom in Christ you having heard the word of the truth. Now look, there's three things in this passage. You can note the sequence is there on the screen. Having heard the word of the truth, having believed and being sealed. Could add that in the early days of the Pentecostal movement in Australia, <clears throat> back in the 1920s, there was a church in Melbourne called Good News Hall, and it was led by a woman named um, Sarah Jane Lancaster, 
She was 50 years old when she started the church and that became the first really organised Pentecostal church in Australia. They published a magazine called Good News, copies of which you can find on the internet if you know where to look. And uh, she often used this phrase, sealed by the Holy Spirit, to describe their experience of being empowered by God's Holy Spirit coming into their lives. Uh, we don't hear it much these days. It's out of the Bible. But we rarely hear it because we've got our own particular preferred phrases, I suppose. But I think it's an important moment because it tells us a little bit about the work of the Holy Spirit that maybe we don't know otherwise. So let's look here. Um, <clears throat> first of all, notice that the, the, there's this sequence, but there's also a sequence of, in, shown in time, not just in words. So in that first part there, having heard the word, that having is, is a past tense, or having heard is a past tense in English, as it is in Greek. Um, and then uh, having believed, that's also a past tense in English and in Greek. And, and that's also sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. <clears throat> now it gets really tricky, and I apologise if you don't know much about grammar, but have, having heard is what we call a participle. It's, if you really want to know an aorist, it's an aorist participle in Greek, but you can get to heaven without knowing that. Um, then having believed is also a past participle, and sealed is a past um, verb which has completed itself and it's kind of the subject of the whole passage. So what the Apostle is, is trying to emphasize here is what it means to be sealed with the Spirit. And he says that you're sealed with the Spirit after you have heard and after you have believed. Now I'm stressing that a little bit because um, most English translations don't show that very clearly. You will notice that I've quoted here from the American Standard Version, which is an older translation. But it's quite literal, and it comes up with what I think is the correct translation of the Greek. Some other modern translations put it, when you believed, uh, sorry, when you heard and when you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. But in my opinion, and the opinion of some other scholars that I've referred to, that's a, an incorrect translation. It's not when you believed you were sealed, it's after you believed you were sealed is what the Apostle is talking about there. In other words, there's a distinction between hearing and believing and being sealed. So I've got those three things listed there. Having heard the word of truth, having believed, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now keep that in mind as we go along because that order is actually quite important. Okay, so here we're going to find out how it happened. Now I should say for the scholars among you that we're not quite sure exactly who the Ephesians were that Paul was writing to. Um, some people say the letter wasn't even written by Paul, but that's a bit of a flight of sceptical fantasy which has no foundation. But was Paul writing just to the church at Ephesus? Was he writing to the whole region in which that church was the center, like he might today write to Adelaide Christian Center, but he might also expect that letter to be distributed through the whole of South Australia, for example. So, but I think all that's really not that important because we do know how the first people in Ephesus came to Christ and what they experienced of the Holy Spirit. And we get that story because it's right, right here on the screen, right out of the book of Acts. So we can go, go to that and we can say, yeah, well, we know that that's how they started. And no doubt, that even if the letter was written to more other churches as well, it's still based on this initial foundation. So I have no hesitation in saying, this is a reliable source as to how these Ephesian Christians first became Christians. So here's the story. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. I'd love to talk to you about Apollos and Corinth, but we haven't got time this morning. There Paul found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no. We've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Now I can identify with that. I remember when I was 14 years of age, I first heard about what the Holy Spirit could do in our lives. I was attending a denominational church, <clears throat> good, good little church, uh, lovely people, um, but they had no, not, didn't know anything much. All, all I knew about the Holy Spirit was when we got to the end of the service, in our Sunday services, we all sang the doxology, which finished up, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's about as much I ever knew about the Holy Spirit. That's like these Ephesian Christians had, didn't even know, had never heard about it. 
we don't, who's this Holy Spirit? They were unclear about that. And I remember hearing about this strange group of people called, in those days, the National Revival Crusade. I thought, who in the heck are they? Never heard of them. And uh, then, uh, without going into a lot of detail, about Pastor Leo Harris, and uh, that led a quest for me, say, I want to know more about this Holy Spirit. And for me, uh, when I first began to look into this, uh, I remember going to a, a meeting <clears throat> in a little congregation or church, which in those days was situated, I think, in Halifax Street. And uh, I went along there with my brother Ken, I went to this meeting. It was one of those real old, old church halls. There was no carpet or anything on the floor, just bare boards, hard wooden benches, and a piano that was only partly in tune. But it had this bunch of people there, and we went there to pray that God would send his Holy Spirit down upon us. I remember being there on my knees on this hard wooden floor, and praying and praying and praying and asking God to fill me with the Spirit. And uh, nothing happened. <laughs> I went home at the end of that night a bit disappointed because nothing had happened. But I saw something else. I saw in those people there was a passion and a love for God that I hadn't experienced before. And that's what touched my heart and got me saying, oh, I'm not going to give up because there's something happening here that I just didn't know about. Well, Paul goes on here, the story goes on here, and Paul said to them, Into what then were you baptized? That's baptized in water. And uh, they said, Into John's baptism. Now, John was John the Baptist, and he was baptizing people, but not in the name of Jesus. So Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, that's about where I was. I had even been baptized at that stage. All I had done was believed. And so on hearing this, they were baptized. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. I remember when I heard about this speaking in tongues business, I thought, what in the world is that? And uh, I met some young people who, were, who had experienced that, but I was quite bewildered by it. I thought, what, what does it mean? How can you speak another language if you've never learned it? How is that possible? And what kind of language is it? And where does it come from? And what does it say? And who's it about? And what's it? And all these myriads of questions. And, uh, but I kept, this disturbing fact kept cropping up that here it was in the Bible. And no one had ever told me that before. And I'd never discovered that. Or if I had, I'd always thought it was way back then, not for us. So my curiosity was piqued. Well, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. They began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there were about a dozen men in all. So that's, and if you think about what we've looked at then, if we go back to Ephesians chapter 1, we've got this sequence, having heard the word, they believed, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And if we look at it here, in this Acts story, that one, you find the same thing. If you look there um, at the beginning, they haven't even heard about the Spirit, into what were you baptised? And then Paul realized they hadn't even been baptized as Christians. So uh, they were then baptized and uh, he, he told them to believe in Jesus, which they clearly did. So they were baptized. So they've been through the first two steps there. They've heard the word and they've believed, as shown by baptism. So then Paul lays his hands on them and the Holy Spirit comes on them. So you can see the same pattern there in each passage. I think it's fairly clear, is it not? And that's just, that's just put into connected passages of scripture together to understand what this means to be sealed by the spirit well it's a significant question that Paul asked them he said did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe they said no we haven't heard if there is a Holy Spirit so this question assumes the possibility of believing and not receiving he says did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe the obvious answer to that question was no. It says that they hadn't. Now, if, if you automatically receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, that's a pointless question. A bit like saying, was your mother there when you were born? Well, you might say, was your father there? But you're not going to ask, was your mother there? It's a pointless question. Um, and so... 
If people automatically receive the Holy Spirit when they believe, then Paul's question is a pointless question. Why say did you receive it? If it was automatic and it inevitably happened. The question only makes sense if it is possible to believe and not have received the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, the question doesn't make sense. Is that all right? You agree with me? Two people agree. Fantastic. All right. So um, we need to understand, and I need to throw the same question at all of us here today. When you believed, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Was that the next step? Uh, you may say, yep, I did. And you may say, no. You may say, I don't know. And of course, the last two questions both make it clear that you have not received the Spirit because if you have, you know. That rules out the don't know one. And, but if you say yes, you know. If you say no, it means you, don't, you, you may also know what you're saying. All right, so let's go on here. So, <clears throat> and we've said all that. Now, they were baptized in, well, perhaps I should go back a second. So back to the Ephesians. Here they are. Uh, he asked the question, you know, did you receive the Spirit when you believed? They said no. Um, uh, Paul then says, well, why were you baptized? And then he tells them about Jesus. Then they're baptized in the name of Jesus. So what's baptism all about? Here's the passage of Scripture from Romans. Uh, don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. All right. So baptism, what does it mean? It means identification with Christ in his death. You see that in that passage of Scripture? We're baptized into his death. It's identification in his burial. Um, and that comes out in the next phrase. We are buried, therefore, with him. And then we identify with him in his resurrection. Uh, we are raised by the glory of the Father so that we too might walk in newness of life. Now the point about all this is that clearly these Ephesians were now baptized, were now Christians because they'd done all that. They got baptized and they expressed their faith. They were now clearly believers in Jesus. So in the verse 6, back in the Acts passage, go back to the original story again. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and so they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. By the way, some people get a bit spooked when you talk about speaking in tongues. Um, I don't know why, but it's, it's um, something about it that I suppose gets people puzzled or mystified. And, and journalists who learn about it typically want to make fun of it. Um, they think that if you speak in tongues, there must be something wrong with you. Uh, they think it's just nonsense. Well, there's a book back there called Praying in the Spirit that answers all those questions. But let me say just this, that when it's, if you, in the Bible, there are words that mean uh, babbling or talking nonsense talk, uh, like they said about Paul, what's this babbler saying? Uh, that's just talking about silly talk. But such words are never used about speaking in tongues. The words that are used about it uh, suggest quite strongly that speaking in tongues is in fact a noble um, you, oh, what's the word I want? Um, noble, uh, well, beyond, above the average level of, of uh, ex expression and enunciation of what we want to say. It's, a, it's kind of an oratorical sort of thing. So on the, on the day of Pentecost, when people uh, spoke in tongues, the, that's the word that's used in Acts 2. Where they, it's the kind of word you'd use to describe a, a classical speech by somebody. It, it's a word with... Um, with no sense of anything stupid or ignorant about it, rather quite the opposite. That it might be the same kind of word you'd use about a speech or a poem or something like that. And I, I've, I've suggested a phrase that we talk about it as being a, um, spiritual praise, um, spiritual expression, rather than just speaking in tongues, because it's something that comes from the Holy Spirit and enables us to speak and, and to... Uh, Pray and to communicate with God in a way that goes beyond our normal ability. So, so here it is. Um, now, in this story, there's a number of things about this here that we need to look at. Number one, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. 
Now that tells us that the Holy Spirit's coming is a, something that's at a given point of time when we can say, yeah, that's when it happened or that's what they did. That's how it happened. Um, Paul laid his hands on them. <clears throat> Does anybody remember how many men there were here? Tell me, quick. Twelve, yeah, twelve people. How many hands does Paul have? These are silly questions. How many hands does Paul have? Two. Um, how many people can Paul lay his hands on at one time? Two uh, at the most. So could he lay hands on all of them at once? Answer, no, uh, clearly not. And that tells us straight away that um, th there was a period of time involved here. You can't with only two hands lay hands on 12 people all at the same time. You've got to do it one by one. And preferably, that's all he would do. Now, again, I say this because there, in some churches, people just sort of say, well, when the Spirit comes, he just kind of floats down like a dove and on everybody and, and so on. And that can happen, but it certainly didn't happen here. And that tells us then that um, these people had only just been baptised, but even so, there was still a time lapse between when they were baptised in water and when the Holy Spirit came on them. Now, if you were number one of the 12, you got in early, but the 12th one could have been a couple of hours before Paul got to him. Tell me, he lays hands and prays it on the people, and they pray in the Spirit uh, with the spiritual eloquence that I talked about before. So we, we can't just... There, there's so much, such a popular belief <clears throat> in uh, churches today is that the Holy Spirit just comes upon you when you believe and it's just a nice gentle thing and so on. But we don't read that in scripture. We don't read that in scripture. In the Bible when the Spirit comes upon people it is always identifiable at a given point in time. So people can say look the Holy Spirit's come because we saw it happen. And it's, it's a quite different concept. And that's why I think some Bible translations say uh, have Paul saying in Ephesians, you know, uh, when you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. But that's not how it happened. Um, even if it's only five minutes before number one, maybe two hours for number 12, it's still not at the same time as the believing. It's something that follows on the act of believing. You still with me? All right, okay. Um, next he says, the Spirit came on them. See that? No, that's in red up there on the screen. Spirit came on them. <clears throat> now, in Pastor Greg, I noticed you trotting out some Greek words earlier on today, and I got a couple too. So <laughs> becoming becoming a bit of a linguistic show, is it? Um, but in the in in the Greek New Testament Greek language, the word for in and the word for on are interchangeable. It's just a little word called en, spelled en. It can mean in or, in or on. It can even mean with. But there's another word for on, which we would translate as upon. That's a longer word, and it can only mean on, in the sense of something coming upon you. It can't mean in. It means upon. And so that's the word that used, Paul uses here. It's just on in the translation there. But you could translate that as upon. The Spirit came upon them. And there's a difference in the New Testament between having the Spirit in you and having the Spirit come upon you. Two quite different things. There is a case for saying that when you believe, then you have the Holy Spirit in you. But there's also a case for saying, but there is an experience in addition to that of the Holy Spirit coming upon you, which is identifiable at a given point of time. That people can see it happen. They know that something's going on. It's not secret. It's not quiet. It's not gradual. It's an identifiable a powerful experience of God's Spirit coming, um, not to make us any more Christian, because when we are, when we are believers, we are Christians, but it's, in, it's to enable us to serve God. So you believe for salvation, but you're filled with the Spirit for service. One brings you to a relationship with God, the other enables you to effectively express that relationship in your everyday life. All right, so there's that one. The same story goes on. Um, when it says and, you'll notice that I've taken a little liberty there. I've put in the word so in brackets. You see it right there. I suppose I should point to the screen sometimes, shouldn't I? There's the word there. Right? So um, I've done that because in this story, 
there's a little tiny Greek word used. It's just spelled two letters, T-E. Um, for those who really want to know, if you must know, it's called an enclitic particle in Greek grammar. Yeah, I'm sure you're thrilled to know that. <laughs> but what it does mean, it has the meaning of and so, rather than just and. So you might say, um, Aloysius and Delilah fell in love and so they got married. Because there's a connection between the falling in love and the getting married. Um, whereas you might say, well, um, he's big and she's small. Well, there's no connection between that. They're just two, two things you happen to be talking about. But when you talk about them in a way that involves some kind of a linkage, you'd use this little particle. And that's what's done here. And Luke, in his recording of this, clearly says, so when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And so they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. That's a very clear um, point in the Greek text, but many translations just miss it, don't, don't allow for it. So that implies a connection, which means that when the Spirit comes upon you, upon your life, that um, that's what you may expect to happen. That he will come, come upon you in power, come upon you with a great impact, and because of that, the first thing you would do, properly, speaking in tongues, spiritual eloquence, or whatever else you like to call it. So there's that. Then, um, the speaking in tongues, uh, notice that again the writer is very careful to say, and this comes out of the original text, they began speaking. Now that implies, does it not, speaking for a continuous time, for some time. If they just said, and they spoke in tongues, well, that could mean, oh, they spoke in tongues for 30 seconds and that was it. But they began speaking in tongues, which implies the beginning of a process. And that's why I suggested before that it would have taken Paul perhaps two hours to pray for those 12 men. Because as the Spirit came by each one, they began speaking, uh, they would be speaking for some time. There'd be a kind of an eloquence about it, kind of a, an ongoingness about the experience. And uh, I can uh, remember back in those early days in Hal Hal Halifax Hall and then the King's Ballroom and King William Street on Sundays where we had these meetings for prayer. Um, we used to have meetings we called tarry meetings or waiting meetings. And the whole idea was just came and you expected to spend time there. Because that all you did was just prayed for a couple of hours. We came praying for the Holy Spirit and we expected something to happen, but we expected that it was going to be something that would take a while. I remember being in one church where I preached on, along these lines and people came forward for prayer and had the orders of the church came out and we were going kind to of pray for these people. And I prayed for a while with the person I had and then after I looked up and found everybody else had gone. I was the only one still there. And I said, where have they gone? What's happened? And they'd all just prayed a little prayer and said, Lord, please fill this brother with the Holy Spirit and went and sat down again. You know, it doesn't usually work like that. Oh, it can, it can, but it's commonly necessary to spend some time praying, as Paul evidently did here, until we know something has happened, something has come in our lives by the Holy Spirit. All right, so it's ongoing. And then tongues, new languages, well, I've talked about that already. And notice that the, the Holy Spirit came, well, it doesn't say all, but um, read the whole story. Uh, it is clear that all of them, all 12 of those who were there, all received the Spirit, all prayed in tongues. It wasn't that some did and some didn't. It was just like the day of Pentecost, when the whole 120 of them, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in a new language given by the Spirit. Okay. And that uh, same thing applied in the record in Acts 2 and also in the record of Acts 10. Okay. All right. So, there was a clear distinction between conversion, baptism, and receiving the Spirit. And I think I've probably made that clear by now. So, back to Ephesians. Here it is again. In whom you also, having heard the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, having also believed and been baptized, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. All right. Now what's a seal? Well, a seal basically in New Testament times was a, a, a matter for confirmation or authentication. Um, I meant to bring 
a document to show you, and then I forgot. But you can see the picture there. Um, a seal is usually not very strong, usually only made of wax. And what happened in biblical times is when something was sealed, it was uh, sealed by pouring some hot wax on the joining between the two documents or the closing of an envelope or something, and then stamping it with your signet ring or your, your like a stone uh, uh, pestle, you just plug it in there uh, to leave a, your particular signature. And it looked like that. It looked like this thing, just a, a blob of wax with a marking um, which was the seal. So it wasn't very strong. But it's interesting that when Pilate supervised the um, burial of Jesus, that they sealed the tomb. And what that probably means is a blob of wax above the entrance, another blob of wax on the rock, on the, on the stone, and a string between the two pieces of wax with Pilate's insignia on it. You know, anybody could have broken that. But the thing was, if you did break it, it was clear that you had gone against the will of the most powerful man in the land, the, the local governor. So people tended not to break things that he had sealed. But it could be in all sorts of other ways, like there are some of the early documents from uh, other sources which uh, have expressions like, um, uh, like the, a lot of, we found a lot of commercial statements a few years back in, in Egypt, all buried in the sand. And, and coming from this period, one of them says, uh, I have sent you a box of plums under seal. And in other words, uh, he packs up this fruit and then seals it. Now again, anybody can break the seal, it's only wax. But if it was tampered with or broken, it made it obvious that the package was then under suspicion. Had somebody stolen some of the fruit, had somebody swapped some of the fruit, uh, what, was it, what, what had happened to it? And so that kind of document, this kind of usage, um, sometimes, like in the book of Revelation, where there's the, uh, the scroll in the hand of the lamb, and it is sealed with seven seals. And that means it was, wasn't any stronger, they're all just wax. And, but seven seal document meant it was very important, very important document. And uh, that's uh, out of that book, being when the seals are broken, then comes this wonderful prophetic uh, revelation of, of the book of, book of that name. All right. So a seal was a confirmation, authentication, um, or a guarantee of a future entitlement. For example, the word for seal was used about uh, 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 what we would call an engagement ring today. <clears throat> Again, not very strong, but the fact that an engagement pact was made uh, and sealed, then it was intended to be a confident expression of a hope to come. So, there. so but the key thing about a seal was it's not the same as the thing it seals. They're two different things. Uh, so if someone gave you a, a very, very, very well gift in a package with a seal, um, you wouldn't take much notice of the seal really once, you, once it was yours. You'd want to get the valuable thing inside. So they're two different things. The reality is what you really want. The seal is simply an auth authentication of that. And that, that's what makes the difference. So the Holy Spirit seals us in our faith. In my book here on the Holy Spirit, I tell the story of an incident some years ago in, in Victoria. I was uh, one of the, actually it wasn't Victoria, it was here, it was uh, just up at Belair, conference center there. And uh, some people had come from Victoria to that conference. I was the speaker at the end of, a, I think the second morning session, I invited people to go to another, another conference room there so we could pray for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And there was um, one, uh, one young woman who came for prayer. Um, she was in her early 30s. Her name was Rosie. And Rosie came um, to pray for the Spirit to come upon her. So I it happened to be I was the one who prayed with her. And as I started to pray, she burst into tears, began to sob with deep, heart-wrenching sobs. And I didn't really know what was going on, except that I had to stay with her and support her and uh, pray for God to touch her life. And so um, I did that. And eventually the tears stopped. And then she began to pray. And as she prayed, she found herself praying in a language not her own. 
And she did that for quite some time and then she sort of sniffed and stopped and looked up. Her face was beaming. She looked like a totally new person. It just transformed in just a few minutes. And so afterwards I said, well, Rosie, look, tomorrow morning, why don't you just share your testimony to the rest of the conference? And I guess there were 50 to 70 or 80 people there. So she agreed. So next morning I invited her up. She stands up. And she then told me the whole story, which I didn't know. <clears throat> and the story was that she'd been brought up in a Christian home. She had tried to be a, a Christian as best she knew. In fact, she had done very well at that. Uh, she, as a child, she was always obedient. Uh, she always tidied her bedroom. She helped for the cleaning up of the kitchen. And she was always ready on time. And she didn't answer back. And she didn't quarrel with her brothers or sisters. And she did well at school. She had so much so that people used to call me an angel. That was my nickname. They called me angel because they thought it was a goody-goody. Um, but she said, then as I grew up, said I fell in love, got married, and then a couple of kids came along. And I think they had three children. And, and uh, she said, I just got so caught up in life that I drifted away from church and I kind of lost my faith. She said, I got worried about that and I used to go and talk to people. And she said, I talked to a pastor, I talked to another pastor. They would all say, look, just believe the word. The Bible says you're a child of God. Just believe that. And she said, but I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I thought I'd fallen so far away from God that surely I had displeased him. Now, you and I might say, well, gee, you fell away from church for a while. You come back. That's not such a huge sin. But for her, it was. She just felt really deeply grievous about this. It just burdened her. So... She said, but then, in her story, as she was telling the conference, she said, then, when I prayed yesterday morning with Pastor Barry and the other people, she said, uh, I, was, w w I cried and cried because I was so deeply ashamed of the way that I'd fallen away from God. And then she and, and no one could ever convince me otherwise. And then she said, the Holy Spirit came upon me. She said, when he came upon me, I thought, wow, God really has accepted me. God really does want me. I really am part of, of his kingdom. And that's why she finished with such a beaming smile that previous morning. And I thought this is a wonderful illustration of just what it means to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's like the Holy Spirit guaranteeing us that we belong to Jesus. Guaranteeing us that he has accepted us. And I went through something similar. Some of you may know that in the 1960s, my wife and I got married in, in 1960. We went to Murray Bridge, just up the highway a bit. Uh, well, not in those days. In those days, it was a little road like this. You got stuck behind a truck. You were stuck there for the rest of the journey. But not far away. Uh, and I remember in our years there, we, we just four years, we started a little church. Um, and, uh, you know, God did some nice things. Some people came to Christ and some people were healed. But there were a couple of very sick people, both uh, suffering with cancer, and both of whom died, even though we did everything we knew how to do. And um, I still don't understand why our prayers didn't work. We did everything we knew how to do. One day I'll find out, <laughs> and I'm sure I'll find out that God always knows best no matter what. And so the fact is, healing begins with the fact that he's with us in that situation no matter what happens. But I, personally, I got very discouraged about these people. I thought, golly, Lord, I pray for people and they die. That's not very encouraging. Uh, and I was, seriously, I thought, well, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to pray for the sick. So I'm not going to build people's hopes up and have them dashed. And so eventually I sort of worked through that. And uh, I thought, well, at least when I pray with people, some people got healed. Now I've stopped, nobody's recovering. And then I thought, anyhow, the Bible tells me to pray for the sick, so I better do what the Bible says. But the other thing that helped me was, I know God is real, because I know when he filled me with the Spirit, what a difference that made to my life. And what a transformation occurred. I know God is real. And so that really kind of pulled me through and helped me to, and so eventually I started to pray with people for whatever need, and I can't say I ever had a reputation as a healing minister, but I can say that there are people who lived another 50 years or so because we prayed for them. And some people who hadn't recovered from things that they would never have recovered from otherwise. And so 
not a big long list, but there's enough of it to say, you know, God's in control still. But for me, it was the fact that God had touched me by his Holy Spirit, and I could pray with the Spirit, that I could pray in spiritual eloquence, speaking in tongues, whenever I needed to do that. And so it became a vitally important part of my life and my experience. And that would be the challenge that I want to leave with us this morning. That uh, what about you? What about you? The, um, I suppose many of you have long since been baptised in the Spirit. And you've probably spoken, prayed in the Spirit. Um, but what if you haven't? What if you haven't? Maybe you, you may say a bit late now, but it's never too late. And some of you uh, who, <clears throat> who may think, gee, I didn't know that could happen. I didn't know that was for me. And I want to just say to you, make up your mind now that it will. To go back to Halifax Street all those years ago, uh, when I was a teenager, it's a long time, 70 years ago. Um, and, uh, and that first time I prayed, nothing happened. But I decided to have another go. Uh, still nothing happened. And then one night, some of you know my older brother, Ken, um, who, by the way, you could pray for. He's very sick at the moment. And I turned 91 yesterday. So he's still going. Um, but he needs your prayers. Anyway, Ken and I shared the same bedroom or sleep out at our home. And he'd been out one night uh, to a CRC meeting. And he arrived home half past 11 or something. I was only at school. And my dad wouldn't let me go out at night during the week, which is fair enough. Um, but anyhow, my, I woke up when Ken came home. We got talking. And uh, Ken, we, he put the, we put the light out. And then Ken said to me, boy, he used to call me boy, and he said, boy, uh, I said, what? He said, do you want to receive the Holy Spirit? I said, yes. He said, well, get out of bed, come over here, kneel down, and receive him. And I thought to myself, hang on, I didn't mean yes right now. I meant yes tomorrow or the day after. I didn't, I, not right now. But I had committed, so I got up, and we knelt down, and for some reason, we never put the light on. I don't know why, but we just prayed there in the dark. And um, I'm praying, oh, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, please send just me. Lord, I need the Holy Spirit. Please, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. And I'm praying like this. And out of the darkness comes this voice. Boy. And I stop and say, what? And he says, what's going to happen when the Holy Spirit comes? And I said, well, I suppose I'll speak in tongues. Well, he said, how are you going to do that when you're so busy speaking English? And I thought, that was a good question. So I just stopped speaking English and started to speak in tongues, just like that. Simple as that. For 40 minutes, we knelt there and we both prayed in the Spirit. And it's, it was a life-changing encounter for me. And almost everything that's happened in my life since then has in some way been touched by this experience of the Holy Spirit coming into my life. I remember the next morning, it was a, that was a Friday night. It was, it was actually the Friday night of October the 31st, 1952. And I say that because October the 31st is the eve of All Saints Day in the church calendar. And so I thought, wow, that's a good day. I mean, people call it Halloween nowadays and they've completely wrecked it. But at that time, it was like the Holy Spirit was saying, All Saints Day, that's for you. Anyway, the next morning I'm playing tennis for the under-13, under-14 B team for Woodville High School. And I probably got beaten. I used to do it. Mostly I did. But every time the ball went behind me into the backside, I'd turn around my back to the other player. I'd go and pick up the ball and speak in tongues while I'm walking, speak in tongues while I came back. Then I'd go and play the next point, go and chase the ball, speak in tongues the whole time. And I was so just thrilled to know that I could communicate with God like this. And so... It just went on like that. I remember riding in the train, going from somewhere to somewhere, just looking out the window, just praying in tongues as, as I travelled in the train. And so it's not that speaking in tongues in itself is a big deal, but it's part of the deal. And the significance is what's important. When you're filled with the Spirit, there's a whole lot of other things you have to do. You'll find yourself doing. You'll be more filled with love. You'll be more filled, filled with joy, greater peace and greater gentleness and greater kindness. And you'll be uh, more willing to praise God. That's one of the things that really struck me, the first CRC meetings I ever went to about that time. That here, uh, go to church and all these people with their hands up, just tears running down their cheeks as they're singing and worshipping God. And I thought, 
I've never seen that before. What have these people got? Well, what's got into them? <laughs> what's got into them is the Holy Spirit. Bringing them. And I'd never people, people who loved Jesus so obviously as these people did. It was just, it was just unbelievable. And you didn't have to stir them up or wind them up. They were just ready to worship and praise the Lord. Because, friends, we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. And when he comes, it's a seal of authentication. He says, Jesus is real. Christian life is real. And this is to prove it to you. This is God's commendation and God's endorsement of what you have. How's that? Is that all right? <laughs> you can have three answers to the question. Question. Um, it's interesting, when, when Paul went to the Ephesians... He didn't say, um, did you learn some new songs when you believed? Or um, have you stopped smoking since you believed? Have you stopped drinking? Have you stopped swearing? No. Do you go to church more often since you believed? Um, do you witness since you believed? Uh, have you learned Bible verses since you believed? He didn't ask any of those questions. He didn't ask any of those questions. The only, did you, in their case, give up your idols? The, the only thing he asked them was, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Because that was a big issue. And it wasn't enough just to believe, but it was so important to accept the reality of the Holy Spirit in your life. So you've got three possible answers to that question. First one is yes. Second one is no. And the third one, I've changed this since I prepared this PowerPoint. Uh, and my third one is now. What's your answer? Yes, no, or now. Are you going to open your life to the Holy Spirit now? This is a church where people still pray for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They still lay hands on people to do that. And I want to say to you, make up your mind now. If you need this, say yes. Now I realize some of you may have kids to collect at Sunday school, you've got a date for lunch with your mother or something, and they're very important, and so you may not want to hang around this morning for a while, I understand that. But if you do, you can. Because there'll be people here who would gladly pray with you. Let's bow in prayer. Blessed Lord. So this is what we pray for now. Just um, have a little think and see what God is saying to you this day. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart right now? Maybe it's beating twice as fast as it should be. Uh, is there an excited expectation there of being filled with the Spirit of God? If not today, tomorrow, or this next, but sometime. Listen to your heart now and hear what your heart is saying. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. So Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will come upon us all. Lord, that none of us will escape but the Spirit of God will work wonderfully in all of our lives in this church. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.